Welcome to Rune Soup, a podcast about magic, culture, and the paranormal. Coming to you from... My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. Enjoy. Today on Rune Soup, as something of a New Year's special, we welcome back author, lecturer, and rights advocate, the inimitable Connor Habib. Connor Habib, welcome back to the show. Welcome to 2017, and welcome to Jurassic Park. Why not? <laughs> I'm glad I don't have to answer whether or not I was a weird kid again. <laughs> no, we've done that. Although I think I think we could... Uh, I've been thinking about yours uh, in preparation for the show, and I'm like, oh, there's, a, there's a few moments there where I thought, well, maybe we could double down on some of it. But uh, <laughs> Great. <laughs> but we are at the beginning of 2017, so there is much to discuss. Principally, and I guess the idea for this show emerged from some discussions we've had in, in Twitter DMs, how we think about 2017, how, where, where our head needs to be coming out of 2016 uh, and what we need to do and what's actually in front of us and, and, and basically what's the best way to have 2017 in our head. And I thought to myself in my head, who is the person who I think I can say with some confidence is, has you know, got that fairly publicly sorted? And that was your good self. <laughs> Thank you. I'm a mess. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> But mess is fine, though, right? It's 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 not a it's yeah. not a mess lack of mess question. No, I'm a different sort of mess. That's that's the key, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I totally I totally agree with you that um, you have a different perspective. I have a different perspective than a lot of people surrounding us, and also. I mean, you can't help but feel the intensity of other people's emotions uh, surrounding you, even if you're not absorbing that uh, the, the same kind of intensity they're having. So it's been on my mind, like, how do I communicate with people? I mean, really interestingly for me, right after the election, a bunch of people called me and apologized to me, and friends apologized to me. It was very strange um, because I had sort of been – this anti-Hillary, you know, <laughs> kick for a while, um, by no means pro-Trump kick, but this anti-Hillary thing. And um, people were like, I'm so sorry I supported her. Why did I give you shit for like, for like coming down on her? We should have known, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, you don't have to apologize to me. But that was actually one of the first responses, which I thought, wow, this is really amazing. Some people have skipped past um, the trauma and the ego shattering that a lot of people are going to feel. And they've just decided, you know what, like my old view or the view that I had hoped was correct, was incorrect. It was wrong. It was unhelpful. Um, now what do I do? So that gave me really just right off the bat, a lot of, um, excitement. And then of course the sort of river of despair started <laughs> flowing by my house too, you know, um, not in my emotion, but I just saw it with everybody else sort of going through it. Well, yeah. And, um, I mean, we chatted about that as it was happening because there were, um, there were certainly, I mean, I'm in the exact same camp. I am extremely anti-empire, which uh, obviously means I'm not pro-Trump either. We're both, you know, we're both team Jill when it comes to that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, and I guess my, my response watching that despair and uh, when it initially happened was um, surprising surprise isn't even the right word. Like, I guess, mild alarm. I'm like, what, what, what worldview have you guys been, <laughs> been living in, in, in the sense that, uh, it's, it's crazy news. Like now, at, le at least we know what's going on in 2017, but you know, the empire was kicked in the balls here. This is, um, mm -hmm. uh, there, there are pieces to, there are pieces to look at and go, well, that's good. What do we do with the next few pieces? How, how do we untangle the rest of it? Right. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think what happily has been brought to the fore here is one component of this massive sort of change in the way that people are engaging with their everyday lives and the world and politics and each other. Um, the one component is that really laid bare this sort of state citizenry disconnect, you know, um, this, the, you know, as we approached the election, there was just this like feeling you could tell that people are really <laughs> beginning to understand like oh this isn't really an election <laughs> like 
this is just like one person will be less not elected than the other. Like, that's it. You know, that's all we're going to have. And that um, people were starting to understand that they had to normalize lying, that they had to normal, that they'd been dragged into normalizing lying, dragged into normalizing deceit, all that kind of stuff. And then they passed through the eye and they sort of kept this state citizenry disconnect. Like they understand it now. It's really, I think, in their face. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people are still sort of hinging it on the fact that the candidate that they didn't like has won. But I do think that there's something deeper going on um, for people as well. And that we're seeing like, Oh, like we're just in this like shitty abusive relationship that we probably <laughs> should get out of. And it, and we, we don't need each other anymore. You know, um, these states and, and, and us, the citizenry, we don't really need each other. And we've been defining each other uh, by each other for too long. Well, is that a good way to, because this is something we were uh, kind of talking about before we hit the record button. Is that a good way to open discussions with, you know, shall we say most of Twitter where the sky continues to fall and their expectations, which we both agree they have a lot of control over, their expectations for 2017 are quite grim. And now they've been dragged either unawares or initially unwilling into this new relationship or into this new awareness that the relationship is dysfunctional and abusive. And we can say, okay, this is, this is where we're at. What are the things we do? What is within your power? What can we, uh, uh, what, what is, what is the next step? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, (laughs) I think it's, you know, for for me, the thing I've always pushed was just have a bigger idea of what the world's supposed to be like, right? Like investigate things more deeply. And then you're not shocked when things go a little wrong, you know, like when things go sort of marginally wrong in the system that was already set up, which was already extremely wrong. So for, for me, it's that sort of question of, all right, it's time to do and think impossible things, you know? And to me, that is like, I mean, I, I was expressed, I was talking to my friend, um, the sexologist, Chris Donahue, the other day about this, like, you know, w- think about just your own relationships, um, the impossibility that we place in our relationships, like people who are in monogamous relationships, for instance, they're like, um, I could never, ever be in an open relationship. I could never let my partner look at another. I could, I just couldn't do that. I couldn't do that. Or even if it's like some different sexual act, oh, I, I could never let that person like, you know, verbally berate me during sex for pleasure. Like I could never do that. Like, I'm just not like, like even just down to our everyday lives and the way we relate to people, very sort of small things seem like complete impossibilities and so it's just that's the first turn is noticing the things that you think are impossible i think and beginning to recognize okay what if i created something here instead of accepting the impossibility and um and that that is i mean that itself is in some ways a bit you you could argue a basis of occultism in some ways, right? Like that we have decided that the the world is impossibly possible at all moments, you know? Yeah, well, you can make the case that the principal concern of the occult is with boundaries, is with that, that boundary between the possible and the impossible. It is an area of intellectual interest. It is an area of physical experimentation. It it lives at that it lives at that moment, um, and, and I guess for me that was the uh, the surprise of reactions within uh, the kind of uh, I guess digital communities that I am involved with at the, towards the end of of twenty sixteen was I thought this is what we did because this like the medicine would be the same regardless of uh, mm-hmm. who got inaugurated uh, later this month. Yes. And well, I mean, that part of that is because you've already, you're either born or you've already gone through your own uh, psychotic break, you know, in a sense, I mean, which is something that you write about chaos protocols, the becoming invincible part. It's like, you know, and I, I've had it in my own life as well, where, you know, I'm using psychotic in the psychoanalytic sense. There are only three, di- three diagnoses in psychoanalysis. It's neuroses, 
uh, perversion and psychosis. Most people are neurotic. And so we're looking at the world, <laughs> we're working, looking at the breakdown of the neurotic world. Psychoanalysis says you can't move from one sort of diagnosis to another. You can't. But the occult says, no, no, no. Like, this is a fundamental difference. We think you can become psychotic. And we think you can become psychotic in a sort of controlled way, not that sort of glorifies schizophrenia, but you can do something here um, where you decide to creatively uh, uh, refigure, uh, remake, reinvent your mind and therefore the world. And so you had something in your life where you did that. And so did I, and people, um, this isn't enough to do that for them. You know, like the political fallout isn't going to do that, but it might give them the feeling that they have to do it. Right. And that's the thing that's so exciting to me is that you were seeing where people's limits of possibility were. And now they might feel the urgent need to uh, change, you know, what they think is a polarity, change what they think is available to them. I like that limits of possibility. That's that's exactly what was on show. Looking at it, it was surprising to see where people's limits of, of possibility were when so much of that, if not all of it, is, is, within, is within our control. To, to, it's, it's all within our control, I mean, in, at least in one aspect, which is, the as, which is the aspect of the sort of current and motion of our thinking. I mean, I think it, it's, it was depressing, right? Like it was, <laughs> I, I think that's where the shock was for me. It was like, whoa, like you, you framed it as like, where have you guys been? And for me, I was like, are you guys really this boring? <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, I was like, come on. And you know, that's not to, I mean, I have my own versions of things that I think are impossible and things that I freak out about. Okay. So it's not like, I'm not some superior being here. I have my own things that I get stuck on, but I mean, <clears throat> for me, it's like, I always just want to push and push and push like the the limits of possibility. So, I mean, the you know, work is one of the places I think about a lot, right? When people are like, we need better wages and we need to have better. I'm like, why the fuck do we need jobs? Like, can we talk about that? Can we talk about like the just the, uh, this idea of work to begin with? I'm not original in that. There are plenty of people who have thought that already, but this does not enter the public discourse at all, right? And so like that just the embedded the way people are embedded in the limits of possibility even with something as every day as work they go and they do it every single day until they fucking run down and fall apart and die and their like limbs fall off and they've done nothing but go to work for 60 hours a week and come home and watch tv in the downtime it's like and maybe like you know made a baby it's like you, that that everyday process it's like it's so limiting and it's re, it's constantly reinforcing their limits so it's not a it's, it really shouldn't have been a surprise to me it shouldn't have been depressing to me it should have been sort of a re, and it eventually was a reinvigorating process of like okay great you went through that shit now what what do I have to offer? If anything, I don't know, but you know, when I have conversations with people, it seems to do something, you know, uh, about this stuff. It seems to do something for them. So. Yeah, it does. And it, I guess the other, uh, the, the limit of possibility or the, the prison that I thought was, um, if anything, a little bit more alarming. And it, it comes back to this worldview, uh, challenge, I suppose is we were talking about, it being a trauma event before we hit the record button. Now that's very problematic because they're including yourself. Um, there are people out there who have had genuine trauma events. Uh, and, and this one is, is some kind of not necessarily a hallucination because the psychological response is, is, is identical. The, the brain can't tell the difference or the mind rather can't tell the difference between dreams and reality. For instance, it still has that same effect. So it's, it's not to diminish the experience of it, but the, uh, uh, the soul is at hand in a way. And, uh, and it's a question of how, uh, we have those discussions for people that are experiencing, like, like physically and chemically experiencing trauma that isn't really there. Yeah, well, I mean, the first thing we have to do is contend with our own anger at them for being so like disgusting so mm -hmm. like, they're not they're not all disgusting right i mean even the words that come out of me as i'm like trying to talk no about I, look we we're, you know? we're both regulars on twitter we've seen some <laughs> disgusting behavior 
<laughs> right. And I mean, I'm just, I, I was angry with them before. I'm angry with them now. And I'm trying to sort of dis, dissemble that anger so I can actually have a real conversation. And you, and it, I've actually been pretty successful at it. You know, I've, I've, I feel like I've been really listening and like hearing people just sort of having something pulled away from them, even though, as you say, it should have been gone in the first place. They weren't responsible. So I think the first place is if you're if you're in a place like Gordon and I, um, dear listener, where you found yourself, you know, shocked that people were so shocked, or you found yourself saying like, "This is how it's always been." Particularly, people, a lot of people of color have felt that way, you know, as as we come through this. You know, the first place to go is like, okay. Um, I need to be able to appreciate that that wasn't people's experience and I need to sort of get, I need to forgive them before I can have a conversation with them. So I need to do that in a work. So that's for me, you know, um, what, what I have to do. And I've been doing it. Uh, it's, it's been going pretty well, you know, <laughs> like forgiving people for supporting the neoliberal paradigm. Well, which yeah, would- you, me- you mentioned people of color, but you're also an Arab American and, and there's a, mm-hmm. there's a, uh, a, a, a serious face slap. I mean, you read my newsletter occasionally. Um, I I was really happy that the empire got kicked the way it did because, um, for the first time in decades, the the sort of opportunity, uh, the, the idea that there might be light at the end of a genocide tunnel, is, mm-hmm. is on the table. Now that is street party good news, and <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> And that wasn't, and, and so my, my, the, the disgust you were talking about was initially that. It's like, uh, especially because I'm, I'm outside the US. So my disgust in half a second goes straight to a kind of sweeping judgment of which the rest of the world has about Americans, which is if it's, you know, if it's on the other side of those shining seas, you have no idea that it's going on. Now, that isn't actually my experience of America or Americans, but. That that was in there, and it's it was interesting to watch that process of uh, people conflating their their trauma with like crying for the for the for the fact that you know there's now the opportunity for drone strikes on your many weddings to never happen again. You know, it's a, it's a low probability, but there was zero probability <laughs> prior prior to the right. election that that would be the case. We have an op- now there's an opportunity, you know, it's like, right, like the probability was just not there. There's an opportunity now for us to do something different. And I think that that's, you know, um, for, for me, it, it, you know, when I was talking about becoming psychotic before, it's like, those are the terms that I want to think on. It's like, okay, you always have to be a little crazier than the sort of opponent or the enemy. Yeah, <laughs> so nice. now I have to be crazier than Trump. Right. Like Hillary was calculated. I mean, the the neoliberals are extremely calculated and they have a really coherent, um, coherent strategy. I mean, it is horrible. It is garbage. It is cruel. It is torturous, but it's very coherent. You know, Trump, it's like, okay, I got to be crazier than that. (laughs) Okay, yeah, you're going to be busy. Yeah, let me roll up my sleeves and see what I can do here. You know, and um, because he feels an in, an intense sense of complete possibility for whatever he wants, whenever he wants. So I need to feel even more possibility than him. <laughs> I need to feel even more is available to me than, than, than that government and that structure, you know? So that's the sort of challenge now. And there are opportunities available, like you said, um, that are just inherently now because he won in- available. And then there's also new opportunities available because I have to push myself past his level of psychosis <laughs> well uh, that's a really fascinating way of describing it so let's talk about how one does that but what are some good ideas to think in in 2017 how do we get our head in the game oh that's a good one <laughs> um okay so we already did the forgiving and we already did the embracing and possibility um i think also begin you know really just Okay, I've thought this when I listen to RuneSoup often, actually, which is, and this is going to drive some people fucking crazy, (laughs) but I'm just going to go with it. People ask you about, like, magic. What what kind of magic can I do? Like, what's, 
what's simple and easy that I can do in my life? Well, the answer is like, well, a lot of it takes hard work. But actually, one of the easiest and most potent fucking forms of magic that gets such a bad rap is the power of positive thinking stuff, right? Is the stuff that you talked about with Mitch Horowitz, this like sort of directional reconditioning kind of stuff. So first, I would do that. And you don't have to buy all the secret, like if you don't want to buy any of like the secret kind of bullshit, because a lot of it is bullshit. But if you don't want to buy any of that high vibe, getting in line with the universe kind of stuff, just think of it as cognitive behavioral therapy. Just think like, if I don't think that things are shit and I instead like sort of adjust my posture every time some shitty thing comes up, I'll be more effective because I'll be clearer and I'll be able to approach the world because I'm not doing it through a sense of denial. I'm doing it through a sense of focusing on, you know, that apocryphal story of Christ when he sees the dead dog and notices the beautiful teeth. You know, it's like I'm focusing on the thing that you know, can matter to me. So I'm creating meaning in this situation that does not make me collapse inwardly, right? So I think that that is like, just as a sort of baseline thing. And then if you want to start bringing in any metaphysical stuff with that, I do think that there is actually something to it. It's cheapened. Well, yeah, no, I, um, I think there is. And funny enough, this came up in, in one of the video Q and A's um, in, in the newsletter, which is now in the, the membership area of the site uh the reality of our dysfunctional western metaphysics is laid bare if you look at it for even 20 seconds now there are a number of souls and and my favorite at the moment at least has some problems but whatever uh is the kind of white headian idea Ooh. that uh your consciousness because like he was a mathematician and a scientist and and so on so he he had he built a metaphysics that would, did not contravene correct science the the actual observable scientific data we can get but he also if you consider subquantum particles as as being made of experience he has this model where um consciousness is is a co-creatory function with reality in a, in, a, in a scientific sense not in a if you if you know not in a dream yourself to a to a supercar kind of way, but in a very fundamental way that consciousness reaches out to objects and and that act is the creation of the universe. So you can actually slot a um, provably better metaphysics underneath some of the stuff we were talking about with Mitch Horowitz, that kind of American hermeticism of of. Uh, uh, of what we were just discussing, and and that should be as particularly for those who have been magically operant for a while who listen to the show. That's kind of like my here's how you here's how you're allowed to do that and still keep your cool card. Uh, you can you can slide some white hand ad- underneath in 2017 and and see how that works for you. You are allowed to start using <laughs> these publicly available things, which, funnily enough, as Mitch said, Trump uses. Right, right, totally. And Ronald Reagan, I mean, was, was huge on it, right? And Mitch writes about that in his book. And I think it's, I mean, I think, you know, I'm, I think if you are really sort of uh, secure in your occultism, <laughs> I'm secure in my occultism, bro. But if you're secure in your occultism and you are a high minded person, there's also no harm in like engaging with some of the stuff that seems flakier. Looking, listen to Esther Hicks, like and Abraham Hicks meditations. So what? Like, if you are, if you're comfortable, you don't have to worry about it being flaky, right? Like, or, you know, engage with this sort of think and grow rich kind of people or whatever. But, you know, trans. Transmute it into something that's uh, transmuted into something that works for you within your own sort of intellectual and spiritual integrity. You know, it's like I, I feel so comfortable with where I'm at with everything that doesn't bother me to like listen to someone talk about their guidance system and the vortex and all that kind of. Stuff. That actually feels fine to me. Yeah. So. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I, mean, yeah. I, I think take that as a marker, too, of, of how stable you might be in your occult personality, or, you know. Absolutely. Or, or ask yourself the honest question of what is your uh, – what else are you using your occult personality for and is it a crutch? Mm-hmm. Uh, because, I mean, one of the reasons is I remain uh, – you know, identified as a chaos magician is because there's like ontological and epistemological freedom in being the unpopular thing that no one likes because I can, I I, I have, I am allowed 
to pick up these things. I still, I found my old Sylvia Brown audio cassette tapes in the garage the other day. And I'm like, yeah, if I can find a way to get these under MP3, I'll see, (laughs) I'll see what, how they've held up over the previous 20 years. I don't, this stuff doesn't, it's more invitational to, to more things. I don't have to pretend to be, and I'm not even saying people who are, you know, full ooga booga grimoire are pretending. I'm saying you need to ask yourself if, that if you are using that experience as an identity crutch and is that getting in the way of uh of a wider experience of 2017 right how's that going for you you know like i i'm so i'm currently i can't really talk about it because i don't feel totally comfortable talking about it but i'm working through the orbital right now right and there is so much. I mean, if you read that, it is like positive thinking the whole way through. I mean, it's hilarious. I mean, it's all linked to God and Christ and all this kind of stuff. But there's so much in there that's like really reflective. So also don't just dismiss it out of hand as like, you know, this actually has re- like a lot of old occult roots. And so you can find a version. I mean, I wouldn't. I wouldn't necessarily go straight to the arbitral if you're, if you're new, but I would, you know, there are all sorts of versions of this that work. And so when you talk about the identity piece, it's like, where is this identity piece, you know, coming from? Like, why are you, you know, why, why are you holding yourself back with your identity? Which is maybe a good segue into talking about <laughs> the sort of failures and triumphs of identity politics in this moment as well, which is something you've been talking about in your newsletter um, quite a bit, you know, and and how people use their identities to restrain themselves and to um, and to st- and to stop themselves in some sort of uh, at some sort of point of progress, you know, and they get they get lost on the way in their own identity. Well, I think we should have that discussion uh, because if you look at the last maybe decade in particular. Uh, Identity politics has been the bauble and the distraction mm-hmm. offered by empire for its perpetuation. Now, and that model has that model has been roundly rejected, and and that is a big part of if you look at the um, the electoral map, eighty five percent of the United States by place voted for Trump. That is very interesting from an animist perspective. Uh, mm-hmm. But. Here's the other part, and I actually had a, a previous guest, I get to say last year, year now, because it's 2017, uh, mm-hmm. Lasara Firefox Allen, who wrote a book called Jailbreaking the Goddess. And I was, mm-hmm. um, I wanted, it was not pushing her because I really like her and we had a great chat, but I wanted to say, is it fair to say that discussions of identity and, and gender and so on are incomplete. Like, we're at a point in the timeline, because this sort of thing is extremely new, and it has been weaponized to distract us from empire. But it's not like next year or towards the end of 2017, we're going to kind of go, ah, it turns out none of this is real. And uh, and back (laughs) we go to the 50s. And ladies, if you would like to follow me back into the kitchen, this is where you stay. Uh, (laughs) I don't see that happening. But what I do see is that... What is a long and complex discussion that I, I mean, she was alarmed when I said, do you think we'll have it sorted by 2050? But I am looking at timelines like that. Uh, How do we have those discussions in a way, how do we unpick the weaponizations of identity politics to have coherent discussions about identity and and how, how important are they? I mean, they're, they're personally, they're microcosmically important, mm-hmm. but how do we fit them into the, the wider discussions that are, shall we say, quantitatively more important in that they impact an entire planet? Right, yeah. I mean, it's really difficult to pull apart, right? I mean, I can just sort of like, <clears throat> if I want, stand right on my two feet and be like, well, yeah, this is, yes, but Gordon, as a neurodiverse gay Arab sex worker, um, this is what, you know, <laughs> it's like I can sort of bring up all my cards to like talk about it with you. But it's like, but it, the, the, the thing is, hmm. I think I think maybe the way we want to talk about it as it relates to the occult, and I you know I love that interview with her and she seems awesome, but it would also drove me a little crazy when I was listening to it in, in not a great way. I mean, the way we might want to talk about it is in relation to words um, and and the the sort of living power of words and and language and how you know 
um, let, me, let me come up with a quote. So Owen Barfield, who is an anthroposophist um, and one of the Inklings, along with Jared Token and C.S. Lewis and all them, he um, he said that there's always a tension between subjective experience and exact language. So there's sort of a ratio between the two. And identity politics is really exact language based. It's like, I'm going to relax into, and that might sound offensive, but I think it's true, relax into the uh, sort of collective understanding of certain words and how those represent certain things. Um, but at the same time, it's going to start diminishing my individuation, diminishing my um, diminishing my ability to express subjectively, right? And to me, that was like the sort of big, uh, the, the sort of big tip off for what was happening with identity politics, realizing, oh, this is so deeply, intensely related to language in a way that seems actually not correct to me, that um, this is really expressing the rise of new sort of mini nation states as a continuation of NAFTA and globalization. And like a world that's sort of becoming more homogenized by the spread of this sort of interconnectivity, people are creating their own, you know, nations and the way that they're and the way that they're enforcing the boundaries are saying, you didn't get the language right, so get the fuck out. You know, the, the biggest defense you can the biggest offense is like a slip of a word, right? <laughs> like not saying the right thing, and then you get sort of like kicked out. Now, of course, the, the you know, like identity as it plays out sort of on the ground in real life, like, you know, there's, there's all kinds of violence related to certain identities and all that. And I'm not dismissing that. And I, you know, have experienced that kind of thing myself. But the way it's playing out as a politic is... Uh, is this sort of weird consumerist Pokemon collect them all nation state kind of thing <laughs> that's going on. And I think that, um, so I think as far as the occult goes, we can talk about it as, you know, language is a place, it's like a dimension where people meet each other, you know? So how do we want to be in that dimension? What do we want that dimension to look like? And how do we form the, the borders and the frame of that dimension with the kind of language that we use? Is it that, a single word can have you expelled from the dimension forever. Um, is it that, uh, is, is it that the, the, the words are condemning words? Um, what's happening there? Um, that's just the start of my thinking about it. Yeah. I, uh, well, that, I, I mean, the nation, nation state thing, I refer to it as it's, it's been weaponized. So this is the malleus maleficarum of the pseudo left. Uh, <laughs> and it's designed to do that. It is, genuinely by design to to have this um fracturing it's a curious mixture right because it's it's fractioning but it's also monocultural uh it's it's that really uh spanish inquisition way of if you say the wrong words you are gone and everyone must repeat the same words and 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 there's only a few of them and that becomes this worldview and it's that is the bit that we it's kind of what i, I I think the step to start having those discussions is to kind of recognize, um, have a bit of sensitivity about how timelines and identity works. If you look at the changing view of uh, women in Western cultures over the 20th century, you wouldn't have picked it. Like, it's 2017. You wouldn't have picked it in 1917 where that ends up. And I think if we have a bit of humility before time about those discussions – and also acknowledge that it has been weaponized and you're kind of falling into a, a pseudo left imperial trap by playing the malleus maleficarum game. I think that's the way we begin to have the discussions because at the moment it's, it's been roundly rejected. Uh, it's been roundly rejected and that is troubling. So we need to find a way of having the discussions that aren't exclusionary and finger pointing and, uh, and, and just a trap. As you say, it's a language trap. You get the word wrong and, uh, and you're in the wilderness. Right. And the, and the, the, um, it's, it's been sort of rejected, but really just in, in favor of a different form of it, you know? Um, so there's really like a class, there's really intense focus on class struggle right now, which I find interesting and also alarming in its own way. Um, and that, that struggle has been going on for a long time between like sort of like, you know, Marxist and identity politics of all sorts. But um, I think that you know, the way, the way that I choose to utilize it in my own life is by changing the sort of concreteness of my identity into something that's active. So it's like, you know, I don't even, I try not to even say I'm gay anymore. I try to say, you know, I'm attracted Wait, to men. Wait, you're gay? Well, not anymore. I've changed my <laughs> mind. 
Um, <laughs> but I try to, I try to say I'm attracted to men, you know? And so like, have it, have it be something that's moving in my life. So it's not this concrete, like stone that I hold in my pocket. And that also, you know, you, um, also you, you turn, you learn from it, right? Like I learned so many things by getting in touch with my father's identity, you know, and how that is in turn, my identity in a different way. He's from Syria. I learn a lot about myself and the world and the way people interact with each other. And I learn a lot about, you know, good, really good things as well from that. But I pass, it's like a, it's like a place to pass through, you know, and people, um, you know, it's that old sort of idea of, you know, on the way to God, someone stopped at the church. You know, it's like, you know, you, you, you should go to the church, but you shouldn't stay there. It's <laughs> just fine. God, it's not, you can't worship the church itself, you know? And so I think that that's, um, it's a place to enter into and then take what you can and then keep moving, you know? And it's not about transcending it. You keep it in you, but it transforms in you when you keep moving. Well, so a couple of things there that I think will um, lead us into the uh, postmodern discussion. When you say you don't use the gay word anymore, that just reminded me of college and Foucault, where you like that's not an eternal identity either. So, like, gay is a twentieth century construct, right? As 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 we have it, and if you say if you're moving to, I'm attracted to men and exploring your, um, you know even if it's not temporary, as you say, is not the wrong word, is the wrong word. If you're engaging with your uh, paternal culture, it, it's interesting that you're essentially creating a, uh, a play out of what same sex attraction was like for centuries in, 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 uh, in European mm -hmm. cultures, because that, that gay thing, this is very Foucault, obviously, but um, gay is a, is a relatively new idea. There were just people in culture who, had different uh attractions if you will right yeah well i mean god forbid i ever anything i ever say be compared to foucault but i do <laughs> think, i do think that i do think maybe the old baldy had a point um but i do think it's like you yeah i'm i'm also just making it rela actually relational to me <laughs> you know i'm not i'm not i'm not assuming the exact language i'm presenting as best i can in language the subjective experience you know and so i think that that's where i start sort of pulling um, pulling back and having some sort of sense of my own being and my own experience and presenting that. And it's not, it's also just not an exclusionary term. Gay is like the most exclusionary fucking term, right? I'm attracted to men does not mean I'm not attracted to anybody else. It's just a statement of something, you know? Um, yeah, it, it, it briefly served a, a, a cultural and, and political purpose, but we have to keep adding letters to this string, and it, it's uh, you know it's insane at this point. You go, I, I think I think this structure of how we do this is is uh, can be optimized, right? Totally. <laughs> well, you mentioned so, exploring the the kind of Syrian side. So you've got a course coming up that has the word um, decolonize or decolonizing in it. So before we get to that, I want to. I'm going to put this to you. Um, what is the value? Because this is a this is a uh, colonizing decolonizing question. What is the value of engaging with Western culture? So, uh, it, it, I presume in your case, because I recall you said your father was Syrian Christian. So, uh, East, well, culturally anyway. Uh, what's the value with engaging in Western culture? How do we do it? Uh, and, and, and how do we incorporate that part into the journey given there are some, given that Western culture has played out in ways that have not been optimal over the last couple of centuries? <laughs> right. Well, first of all, I mean, you know, n no cultures like do all that great, <laughs> right? So, I mean, we have a certain kind of power. Um, um, going on. And so that's, that's the issue. Um, and I think that, and, and of course, you know, cer certain cultures do better than others. Um, but I think that it's important for us to um, look at ourselves with some fascination and not merely condemnation, which is sort of the round, you know, like the U S sucks, you know, the Western culture is so like, it's like, okay, 
what what exactly are you getting out of saying that? You know, we can call out all the things that we do, but um, <laughs> what what value is it in like creating a totalizing statement like that? Except to sort of you know lend yourself to some other kind of totalitarianism. It's just bizarre. So I. I want to look at how completely fucking weird things are, you know? I mean, there's like, what was it, it was Wittgenstein, right, who said something like there's an entire mythology within our language that we have not, we don't even explore the spaces between our words. We don't explore the size and shapes of objects. And people that do that are anthropologists for the most part. I mean, people that, people that do that, you know, with, uh, Certain sociological things, you can be a sociologist and do it, or you can be a psychologist and do it, whatever. But I think that sort of looking upon our own culture with a complete sense of what the fuck is going on here. Now, the occult is particularly equipped to do that because it, um, it from the start, at least most, in my mind, intelligent forms of the occult, from the start, admit and understand that the world is not the world that we thought it was um, at some point in our lives. Like, you know, whatever, whatever kind of thing we've inherited, we've decided, no, 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 no. There's more going on here. And there are other beings um, uh, right here with us right now in this moment. So the occult is good at doing that. But um, it, there are plenty of occultists that don't stop for a second and think about how fucking weird their cars are, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> and how bizarre, how bizarre it is to transform you know, metal and crystals and sand and dead animals and p- parts of trees into, you know, essentially a machine that flies above the ground. Like we don't, we might think that as sort of a whim, but we don't do that in our everyday lives enough. Or um, there aren't enough occultists that are doing phenomenology, which is really a, a branch of anthropology in some ways, um, where I'm really assessing. Um, what happens when I take a walk down the street? Really, really fucking getting into it, you know? Um, so I think, and, and what the street looks like and what the si- where the sidewalk came from and all that kind of stuff. So I think sort of getting into um, the anthropology of everyday experience really, I hate when people say re-enchant. It's always enchanted. I mean, there's just one type of enchantment or another type of enchantment. It's like, there's no need to re-it, you know? But I, so I think that that's, part of the that's part of the value is understanding how fucking strange things are so you can um so you, so you can actually how about this so you can be in touch with reality <laughs> you know like i mean i think it's as simple as that it's like you want to actually have some grasp of what's going on instead of imbibing from the fucking tit of like some crazy horrible spirit that's like possessed you and separated you and replaced you know your connection with reality with its own fucking story because people in institutions and power are constantly worshiping and giving that being power well okay like start to look at your culture with a sense of like bafflement and one of the ways that you can do that is by looking at other cultures i mean that's how a lot of people do it and they're just like wait they do that but we do this wait, they do that but we do this and those things are kind of the same and why am i taking for granted that i do this etc cetera, etc cetera. So is is looking with bafflement? Uh, would we consider that a, a like a, a decolonizing process? It's a two part question. That's the first one. The second part is: is this a way? Because it's sort of an infinite loop when we start using words like anthropology and uh, or anthropological terms, and even decolonizing, colonizing, and so on. Is how do we? Uh, what's the process process of acknowledging and extracting the actual good components of Western culture, of which there are many, uh, mm-hmm. and they are principally th- amongst them are the uh, the intellectual and, mm-hmm. as a result, political tools around personhood and analysis that have been used very improperly over the centuries, but also allow this process. Uh, so, is is this kind of engaging with your culture with bafflement? a decolonizing process and is this and is part of that pulling the pieces out that we uh a, a, and at least acknowledging their value and their limitations as we go along with it because we're using some words here that are very powerful and are 
the product of of a journey that's also done some uh, that's that's had good and bad impacts over over the world. Yeah. Well. Okay. So first of all, as you say it back to me, I'm profoundly <laughs> like, tuned into how much bafflement sounds like bafflement, and <laughs> and <laughs> how we look at our culture with bafflement. I mean, it's it's kind of it's kind of funny. Like, what spirit do we want to bring in as the sort of glasses we put on to look at our world? So that's that's one way of thinking of it. I mean, I think that to sort of roll the two questions together into one, you know, the the real the one of the real tasks, as far as I'm concerned, and you don't have to agree with my version, but one of the real task of Western culture is to engage with the occult aspect of thinking. And we we ignore thinking to like an insane degree. We pay attention to thought. Um, but the sort of current gesture and movement of our thinking is really just fucking lost to us. And so that is one of the great um, advances of, you know, Rudolf Steiner and anthroposophy is to really pay attention and place a lot of the Western occultist task in uh, engaging with the flow of our thinking. That requires, that requires something um, that I think is part of the West's task, really, because most of our advance, I mean, we see that, we see the currents of thought and thinking running through our culture, you know, and it really pisses me off when the sort of, like, anti-intellectual occultists come up. They're like, don't think, you think too much. Move with your heart. Move with the spirit. Move with the blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no, 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 no. Like, yes, you can do all that, but let's also understand that there is a motion and form to the process of thinking itself that we are completely out of touch with. And all we see are the thoughts, which are the product of the thinking. We don't know how they got there. We don't know, uh, we, we don't know the processes by which they are born. And so, um, so that's where, that's where I would go. I would start tracing thought back and seeing how it emerges from different currents of thinking, and then try to get into the currents of thinking themselves. That is a lifelong fucking process. So I'm not saying that I am in that zone. Sometimes I am. Um, but I think that that is the Western, it, like, just to break it down, I mean, I, I realize you might even be talking in just sort of more specifics or, you know, aspects of culture or whatever. But for me, if I'm to put to a real foundational level, that's how I'd answer your question. Yeah, sure. There's a, um, at least a, a classically Greek uh, conceptualization using ideas like logos for how flow of thought moves that's, that allowed them to think about thinking and and describe it in ways that allow other people to kind of get into or at least acknowledge the flow, which is kind of funny enough. It does go back to the where do we find the valuable pieces in engaging with Western culture because there's loads in there. I was being mm-hmm. specific uh, to when we talk about when we use terms or uh, kind of modalities from an anthropological world, this is, this is hugely powerful. This is a hugely powerful knife, mm. but it has a lot of blood on it. So that's kind of the point. Uh, that, that's kind of where I was going as well, that the Western culture and Western thinking has provided us with some immensely powerful ideas to do with uh, sovereignty of personhood and uh, and its sort of resulting equality and and the economic implications of that to do with mm. um, exploring the world and 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 ownership of body and property and and that kind of thing. Sometimes it goes wrong, but these things emerge from it, and and that kind of notion has been subsequently weaponized. And it seems to me that, as you say, the ones that frustrate you, which is like the go with your heart people, the ones that frustrate me is the unthinking, complete dismissal of, uh, of anything Western as well, you know, you guys had empire. So this whole thing is, uh, is, is, is fucked. Yeah, well, everyone had empires, <laughs> for a start. Right. but also yeah. that's really, you were just throwing out some hugely valuable things. Um, there's a lot of very valuable babies in that bathwater. And, and I think for me, one of the 2017 pivots, and it comes back to things like Christianity. It comes back to 
the actual Western current, and I, it's a profoundly unpopular thing to say amongst uh, occultists, but these things don't you don't just throw them out. You are, you are built of them. It's kind of that that flow of ideas. The fact that you can throw them out, the fact that you can form an identity in rejection to these things and not be stoned to death or still allowed to drive a car, come from this flow of ideas. And and there's a we need to talk about how we acknowledge and get into and out of that flow. Totally. So, you know, I mean, the, the, the first thing to say is that, you know, every sort of spiritual being out there, every single one of them, except maybe one who I won't name, and maybe y'all can ask Gordon later and he'll tell you if he has the same name as me, but it, it is, is pretty redeemable by our thinking. And in fact, our task is to work with them and where they're not sort of aligned with us to sort of move forward with them in some way um, that, that unites us and w- whatever. So I would say that for anything. So we could say that there, you know, all the beings that are invested in anthropology are invested in scientific, um, uh, even materialism, right? These are beings that await us to greet them in a certain way. And um, I think we've done that. That's, that's what my entire course is about, by the way. It's like, what aspects of science, what aspects of sex, what aspects of the occult, what aspects of philosophy have we, have people greeted have in, in the proper way, and then we can sort of retrieve them, right? And that's what, you know, anthropology does now. I mean, you're right. Anthropology has all this fucking blood. It, it went, it's not just even a sacrifice. Like it did a lot more than sacrifice to get to where it is now, where anthropologists, you know, the good ones will go to different cultures and say, okay, I need to do an anthropology of myself. That's the only anthropology I can really do. Um, study of, study of man. Fine. I'll study myself. Um, when I'm in this context, see what happens and try to, sort of take apart the, the pieces of my mind that don't allow me to understand who this other person is. So I think that that's the decolonizing part of anthropology, right? With science, it's like, okay, I'm going to encounter this phenomena, um, whereas previously I would do a great violence to the world by pretending I was separate from it and discarding my emotions, discarding my interaction, discarding my experience of the phenomena. This time, you know, as per Goethe or scientists who are really good and sort of on the ball now, I'm going to investigate what in me happens when I interact with this phenomena, not just in some Heisenberg principle of, oh, I look at this particle and this other particle changes in this quantum physics, whatever kind of way, but rather, which, which is also interesting, but rather... I'm going to look at what happens in me as I engage with this phenomenon as well, because that is part of science because it's a relation, you know? So this it's, it's a way of greeting, you know, and these spirits and beings await us to greet them in a certain way. Um, almost all of them. And so I think that that's, I think that that's part of it. Um, the blood, the blood on the hands of the disciplines is because, uh, we fucking met them the wrong way and it felt good for us to meet them the wrong way. And we didn't either didn't know what we were doing or we really enjoyed the power and violence that uniting with these beings gave us. I mean, it's all magic. It is. It's uh, so I'm just, I'm just going to pull these out into generally how we be awesome in 2017. And the first one is that, uh, 21st century flaneur model of, of being baffled by your own culture. So sort of blurring the flaneur, if you will. Uh, mm. <laughs> number two is essentially a flow model, like a thought flow model. Uh, and, and if you're not understanding that, that's, that's kind of your homework to go and um, mm. recognize. And that flows into what we're just talking about there. And this kind of, it's very Isabel Stengers in a way, because what you're talking about is a, as I interpret it, uh, is a kind of like a component of my 2017 quest to restore animism to the big table, which is uh-huh. conceptualizing <laughs> ideas as non-human persons, which she's very good at. Um, like all the kind of prominent people to- in in academia talking about anthropology at the moment, it doesn't take it to the necessary next step, which is actual spirits exist, which belongs in animism. Uh, and I appreciate that the, the culture of academia makes that problematic to do publicly. But she's talking about how we engage, how we conceptualize ideas as, as non-human persons. Uh, and 
that is a way when you say there's a way of approaching these spirits in these forms that we haven't done before something very different happens when we do and that's kind of the the value of of even if you want to adopt it as an experiment, I, I, I guarantee you'll stay in it for a little bit longer, dear listener. Uh, but even if you want to adopt it as an experiment, have those engagements and conversations with ideas in the kind of forms that Connor's describing. Yeah, I think that's great. And I mean, and if, if you want to know what it's like, you know, just think about someone you know and think about how it feels when you approach them thinking, what am I going to get from this person versus like, who am I in the presence of this person? Who are we together in the presence of each other? I mean, it's just a, such a completely different fucking question, you know? And so I think, I think that those are all like, I think those are all great works. I think, you know, the, maybe one more point for um, 2017, although it kind of spans the other ones, is like, just stand back and see what's going on. I mean, this, this sounds so obvious, but it's, it, it's not obvious to people. So we have book after book after book about how technology is like changing is changing the world right and how cell phones and the internet are changing things but you know and and a lot of it takes the, the, the place of blame um so this is i'm using this as an example a lot of it takes the place of blame it's like oh well like the internet is changing the way we interact with each other and blah 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 but just stand back and say okay these are products of our consciousness so what's happening in our consciousness that's producing this right might we view um might we view cell phones and the internet as a change in the way we engage with time and space you know um might we um start to examine <clears throat> sort of either mass shootings or um, groups that sort of don't articulate their aims um, in any sort of way, whether it's Occupy or the sort of shadow side of it, which would be ISIS, might we view these as a sort of different kind of presence that's coming from our consciousness into the world, a different kind of need for presence? In other words, stand back and see things as phenomena of being um, in yourself. So we are talking about the spirits before, but see them as a phenomenon of being in yourself, who you are, what's coming out of your consciousness, instead of pretending that the external events are leading your consciousness. Of course, there's an interplay there. Of course, that's happening. But take that side on it as well. Um, how are these produced um, from the way that I am right now and from who I am right now? Well, that kind of comes back to how you were conceptualizing the car, because if you talk about the phone and the internet and so on, they are not uh, the extension of, well, as I say, they're not only consciousness. Uh, that is what happens in, in a kind of meeting of ideas. And as a result, the earth itself has built itself into these forms uh, and, and we're a part of that. So it's kind of looking at the flow of it. Like a, a phone is composed of hydrocarbons and rare earth minerals and, and so on that are configured in a way that is part of this consciousness and flow. And, and, and these are the kind of opportunities to, to be in, in 2017 in a, uh, in a more enriching manner than I think people typically do as a quick reaction. <laughs> totally. I mean, everybody it's like, and the way this is filtering out is, is in, in the wrong way is a rejection uh, of anything. So, right. Like, I mean, I think without going down the environmentalism sort of nature rabbit hole that we, we can if you want to, but we'll go pretty far over. But it's like the, the time, but it's like, you know, people are like, oh, no, uh, no more cell phones, uh, no more computers, you know, <laughs> like people get this sort of like reactive, like they can't handle it. But what you're talking about is no, no, no. What we need is. First of all, it's here. So fuck you for saying get rid of it. It's here. It's arrived. The alien is in your living room. It's in your hand. It's all around you. So how do you want to see and talk to it, right? How do you want to understand that you're holding fucking a combination of crystal and effort and <laughs> again and like dead animals and sacrifice and basically, you know, imagining telepathy and all these kinds of things in your hand when you hold your cell phone? Or do you want to be like, oh, man, like, I just addicted to my phone, you know? <laughs> it's yeah, like, I know. It, it, it's, it. it's an event in the timeline. It's a thing that happened. And it is it is a configuration of, uh, of the Earth and human consciousness. It is also a cancer-causing surveillance device. It is all of these things. <laughs> and so 
just go it like to, to fall into that uh like it, it's an event as you say it's in the living room it's a thing that's happened in the timeline uh, a rejection is still a relationship with it because it's a relationship defined by absence so it, it exists it's a thing right uh and that is a way of being in flow i think that is uh again yeah it's it's underutilized at in 2017 we're three days into it, but it's underutilized in 2017. Yeah, like the neo-primitivist, like, like get rid of all the technology, it's kind of like a weird technological atheism. Like, if I just pretend it doesn't exist and never did exist, like, I'll be better off, you know, <laughs> some sort of weird thing. But I, have one more, I have one more thing of advice, and I should have said this from the outset, which is get a fucking relationship with death in order. Get it in order, whatever that means to you, right? Because the, the, here's the thing. Gordon and I could be com- – we're, we're not wrong, but we could be completely wrong about everything and there's no hope and, like, we're just heading toward total fucking nuclear obliteration or whatever, okay? So if we're wrong, we all die, okay? And that's the worst that's going to happen. I mean, well, there could be a dystopic future and that might be worse for people who don't like being uncomfortable. But if we're wrong, we, we all die. Okay, great. So get a relationship with death. You should have one anyway. And, you know, something that you talk about constantly, Gordon, is like having a relationship with ancestors, having a relationship with the dead, speaking to them. And I also mean, you know, and and that's one way of approaching your own death. And I also mean just approaching your own death and understanding that you're carrying your death around inside you at every fucking instant, you know, and your your skeleton is inside you. So so fucking get used to it, you know, And, and start to understand that because... You, you can't fucking guide your political, ethical, moral life, definitely not your occult or spiritual life. Um, you, you can't parade it around uh, avoiding death. So get that, get that squared up ASAP. Yeah, that's uh, absolutely. It, it, it actually is a way of – it's the fastest way to – getting into the headspace that allows all the other stuff we've been talking about to be part of your life. It, it relativizes me and the ancestor component. I mean, it, it's, we were talking about this because over the last couple of weeks, uh, the option or the opportunity or the potential to live in a dystopia in 2017 is, is in your head. And, and with Austin, when we were doing our um, 2017 astrological forecast just before Christmas. He said the the kind of radical act for 2017 isn't the dystopian fiction that we're seeing everywhere. It's the utopian fiction, and and a huge part of that can come from the ancestor work because, like, do you think 2017 is the worst year that you're like? Is that going to be worse than what your ancestors lived through? Are, are you <laughs> fucking kidding me? There is there is a lot of wisdom that comes from that uh, humility and relativization that uh, that can give you the the perspective to go. Actually, that's completely correct. Uh, they certainly li- they mine literally lived through and worked through wars. I presume you know worked in wars. I presume yours did as well. Uh, this stuff all these kind of tools that emerge from well, what we're calling the occult or magic or so on are, are available to make 2017 essentially is fucking uh, a lot more awesome than you think it's going to be right now. Totally. I mean, I think, I think that, you know, in some weird, you know, Kierkegaardian way or whatever, it's like the, the, the despair has so much fucking potential for people. I didn't, I've already felt the despair I mean, it was long, long ago. So I've been like, you know, I've been doing okay, you know, but the, for, hopefully, you know, it'll go really deep. It'll go really deep for people and they'll begin to see, you know, a continuity um, between things, a continuity between life and the, being, the living and the dead and life and death, a continuity between thought and material, a continuity between, um, you know, having what you want and wanting things, a continuity between our culture and other cultures. I mean, that's what that's what happens when despair comes and sort of bottoms out the separation that you felt right so when when people have their identity shattered because they were neoliberals like that identity was based on complete separation from so many things that there is a continuity that they refused to see whether it was drones or whether it was 
uh, their their party and the Republican Party or whatever it was. So, you know, one hopes that the despair will reveal continuities to people. Well, that's splendid. Uh, you mentioned the course. We're, we're, um, we've come up to the hour. Tell us more about the course, Connor. Okay. <laughs> Radical Undoing, Decolonize Your Mind with Sex, Science, the Occult, and Philosophy. I've already talked about it quite a bit. Um, it's just, it's on January 22nd, so that weekend. Um, <laughs> well, if you guys are all out there, you know, thinking January resolutions and doing horrible things like not drinking for a month, uh, do, do this instead. <laughs> I think that I think that's a great idea. And so um, you'll have it in show notes, yes? The, all of the, that stuff. Perfect. So I don't even really have to say anything. Just come and join me um, for the class I'm going to do, which will get me arrested by the, you know, like like uh, detained by the FBI two days after the inauguration. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been, I think, an essential breath of fresh air for 2017. I think it can blow out some of the cobwebs and, and get people... It, it it sounds kind of a bit too base to say get the, get your head in the game, but there is a big part of that. Twenty seventeen is going to be a, a remarkable year in in many respects, and and there is a lot of opportunity and some risk in that. So I'm really I'm really glad we got to talk about how we have an opportunity of being in twenty seventeen. So Connor, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, thank you. And um, if you guys want me to really freak Gordon out um, in, in, in this podcast, I want to say, Gordon, like this podcast gives a lot of people um, the feeling of freedom and compassion that's necessary to move. That's all we have time for this week. That's <laughs> 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 no, thank you very much for the uh, for the kind and awkward words. Where's the stop button? <laughs> <laughs> uh, love your work, Mr. Habib. All right, you too. There you go then, starting 2017 right with Connor Habib. And if you've decided that this is going to be your year, check out Connor's course coming up on the 22nd of January. You'll find all the details at the blog or in the show notes. And speaking of courses, the RuneSoup Premium Membership is now available, if you hadn't heard. The first course will be an in-depth tour of Sigil Magic, and that starts next month. There will also be a few surprises between now and then. Uh, that's all I'm going to say on that. Uh, other than that, please do subscribe to the show on iTunes or in your favorite podcatcher. Stop by and say hi at runesoup.com or the RuneSoup Facebook page, or find me on Twitter, where I am Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N, underscore white, W-H-I-T-E. I hope you all had a wonderful festive season and a happy new year. Until next time.